South Dakota's educational effort to raise awareness about the importance of soil health continues. The USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service entered into a cooperative agreement with the South Dakota No-Till Association and iGrow South Dakota State University Extension for delivering these seminars with the latest soil health and productivity technology to South Dakota farmers and ranchers. Andy and Mitch Hohenhaus have been farming together with their father near Lisbon, North Dakota for 20 years. Their farm includes 5,000 acres and a 350 cow capper. <coughs> the Hohenhauses began using no-till in 2001, adding cover crops to the mix in 2005. The farm, which is situated in the southeast corner of North Dakota, is an area that is prone to flooding. Moisture in the spring makes it difficult to get to the fields, and no-till and cover crops have helped them overcome these problems. So guys, we're really glad you came today, and we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. I'm Mitch. I'm Andy. We're uh, from the southeast part of North Dakota. We're uh, happy to be here today. Uh, to be here. This is our uh, family. Start with here. The picture is probably three or four years old. So we can a little bit. Located right by Lisbon, um, five miles up the Carl and Cheyenne River Valley. For approximately about well, 75 miles from Fargo, about 30, 40 miles from South Dakota border. I'll give you guys some idea of where we're at. This here's just a picture of the farm. The shine was all the way around us. And we've had trouble flooding in the past, 09. Um, the were really bad. Uh, since then, we've built dikes around the farm to protect it. Uh, our grandpa, grandma started this back in 46 when they moved there. Um, Dad took over and we actually are farming with them yet. Previous operations, well, first of all, there's three of us involved, mom and dad, and Andy and myself. Crop land acres, we've got just one pivot irrigated and the rest is dry land. Um, livestock stock, what's going to be help gap pairs. About 2,500 acres of pasture. Soils, we got everything from River bottom to gravel pit. Um, growing seasons, you see there's a rainfall in the last uh, 10 was a bad year. Um, 10 and 11 are the more <coughs> the normal rainfalls. And later on in the presentation, we'll kind of see what we mean by that. Previous um, crop system, wheat, corn, both grain and silage, soybeans, sunflowers, and alfalfa. And we used to do tillage, uh, chisel plow and a moldboard plow, um, plus spring field cultivation and prior seeding. And uh, <coughs> our routine, I guess. Why we went to um, no till, the biggest reason is we needed a bunch of new machinery, primarily the drill and the planter. Um, we were taking on more acres all the time, and we didn't have no hired help for the most part. So we were trying to do the same amount or more with the same amount of help or less. Uh, we were looking at a way to cut input costs, and then Dad wanted to know if we'd want to try this. Um, Grandpa and Dad, back in the 60s, had tried a little bit of a long tail. Um, Dad said they had a planter that was able to put it into the ground, but the chemicals and stuff back then were they're basically zilch for the most part, so they had a lot of weed problems. Um, and I guess they tried it later on. Uh, my uncle was involved with it then, and grandpa and dad, they tried it kind of in the early 80s. Same deal, they had some equipment that were able to put the uh, uh, seed in the ground, but they never pursued with it due to, I think it was weed control, was probably the big thing back then.
first change uh, the fall before 2001 to completely switch from conventional to uh, no-till. We didn't. We left everything on work. Um, crop rotation, still corn, um, wheat. We have added peas, um, winter wheat, radish, soybean, canola, and alfalfa. Includes all four uh, crop types. Uh, obstacle encounter uh, resident management. We started. We didn't have no chaff spreader on combine. We didn't pay no attention to what we're doing. You know, on combine, you just get the crop off and uh, it looks like you ain't uh, Seeding for the first three years, the ground. We started. We had dirt. Drill. We had trouble with the trench closing back up, and, uh, and then the weed control was a little more. We had a lot more weeds. Uh, and, um, we had a nice lawn weeds for the most part. Um, <coughs> like he said, the ground was grew on grew underneath, dry on top, crusty, and it was a big change from what we've been doing. It didn't look like it was for the better to start with. Uh, then later on through the process, uh, years into it, we got the excess moisture and stuff. And then some of the other things where we're, uh, some of the uh, crop insurance programs, one thing I can remember back then was uh, you had to work your sloughs or, wet, or wetlands to fall by again for prevent plant the next year. Uh, if you don't do tillage, what do you do? Well, we just pull them. Uh, we got by with it. Part, but at the time, I don't know if it would really help to borrow with the insurance. Well, in the resident management, uh, we had trouble set the chaff and the combine. We added chaff spreaders, uh, paid a little more attention to the choppers, got the straw spread back out as best we could. Then we, uh, on the wheat, we decided to go to a stripper head to leave all that straw standing instead of a big mat of stuff on the ground. And then we tried to cut, we used to run two combines on the small grain, but we tried to cut back <coughs> one combine with the stripper head. That worked for about the first two years. We added more acres, so we now we have two of them. And I remember one of the big things on the, on the car, uh, residue management, without chaff spreaders, it was one spring, the snow was all melted. We got a little skip to snow an inch or two. Uh, we had one field very close to home there. Drove by the end of it where uh, you come by and you could see strips out there. There was snow, no snow, snow, no snow. To start with, we didn't know what the reason for it was, it, but the chaff strips versus the darker ground. Uh, the ground was actually, you could see, it had to have been warmer because the snow disappeared. It actually took uh, a day or so difference in that. Uh, and then. We've been to Hurley County to some of their stuff in the meantime and learned a lot more, especially in residue management, which got us a lot farther into it and it helped us a lot. <coughs> Dad, uh, <clears throat> made comment, Mother Nature will take care of itself, leave it up to man to screw it up. When we got going on the no till, the, the wet, low lying ground, if we didn't. This year was a low ground that we hadn't cropped for years. And uh, the first pass, I went through it, no problem. Second pass, over here, which you can't see. Yeah. And the second pass, and this is where I ended up, uh, I didn't fall asleep. <laughs> uh, anyway, probably the next picture, I guess. The more we got into the no-till and the cropping of, of the wetter ground, if you could crop it, get a crop in there every year, this doesn't happen as much. And uh, this is one that we hadn't had a crop in probably for five, six years, where it's just a slew and you can mow it or well, back plant it, to plow it. And uh, right where the tractor was, there was absolutely no vegetation. There was no weeds as it been. It basically was a low spot. Where all the water always did set back with the cart that sat in there. Um, there was, we were able to grow weeds uh, right behind the drill, probably as 
probably the end of what we had been cropping. Um, we finally got, we had to take the tractor out by itself after we got the, everything on hooked. Uh, we had a smaller four wheel drive set in there. It took a lot bigger four wheel drive to pull that one out and this one out. But when we got the, this tractor out, we were able to back in on a 45 degree angle uh, over here, small four wheel drive. And we got the cart from the tool, and that thing actually pulled the cart out by itself. So, and we didn't, like I say, we didn't learn until after the fact. We didn't know why it, we fell in right there. But there was no vegetation, basically, with the tractor was setting. And later on, down the road, I took this picture and learned a lot more with, with the motion. This is soybean harvest. <clears throat> This, I think everything was seeded and then it got drowned out. It had been cropped probably for four or five years. The the fall, late fall rain. Yeah. And we got a lot of rain right in the fall right before soybean harvest. And that's what we learned that if you got a soil structure there and you keep the combines empty, we can pretty much harvest everything that's left out there. And I believe this was an old eight. I think the next picture is that uh, for the most part. We probably had six, seven hundred acres of beans. We harvested, I'd say, just about, I don't think we already left an acre total due to water we were able to harvest. And this is another picture. Uh, same deal. It been, this one, we've never had a slew party here, and it was, I don't know how much rain ended up here, but keep the combine empty and keep the header above the water, of course. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we were able to, able to get 99% of them. it was a little bit wet that summer too but with the you got good soil structure with the plants growing and I'm sure we were on the skinny there on the sprayer then uh, it carries up very well for the most part and tracks are minimal here we never the combine tracks we never did go back in and level up and the water leveled off a little bit of what we did do uh, it wasn't three four inches of, of a rod I mean we never done nothing to it after this. Mm -hmm. The big key was you have a grain cart, you got a dump 50 bushel off the combine, and it's that much weight that you're getting rid of and keep the combine empty and go for it. Here's a video on later on and a year or two later. Um, seeding, you get bored, you get auto steer, so you play with the phone. And, and uh, <coughs> same deal, is, I don't like the turn for slews, but this ain't much of a slew. But, Same deal here. Normally, this is not a, a wet spot, but it was a lot of rain early in the spring, and we didn't have to turn for anything. But you have to know your ground to a point because there is sometimes the water will sneak up on you. <coughs> this is another one with a very important plant time. People ask us, you know, what's the point of doing this? Well, <laughs> a lot of guys <coughs> seed up to us or seed around a slough and turn around there, and you get, we'll get ruts going opposite way. Compaction. Yep, and compaction. And then if you do get ruts, then you got to bounce across them. Around keep, ways. keep your ruts the same way. So they, we don't have that much <coughs> ruts and stuff like this that we do, but. And over the years, we've added CRP to the cropping system and, and without plowing it. <coughs> this here is a aggregate slack test that they did a tour at ours, all different deals. I think it was the NRCS went around. Um, ours on the, on the left side of you guys was the eight years of being in the no till. Um, they took a chunk out of the CRP there in the middle. And uh, conventional till was a neighbor's right across the road from ours. 
and you can see in the bottom of the jars the aggregates of stuff that settle out. Um, when you got good soil structure, everything holds together. There's very little there in the CRP one. Ours is a fair amount, but it's getting better. And the convention they tilled that pretty much after a half an hour, an hour, it was all settled out in the bottom of the jar. So on the CRP, we got molehills and condos and stuff. We got to get knocked down. And we tried different ways. We'll take a disc and just set the stop so on a hard, flat surface, it's just tickle in the ground and we'll go across it two, three times just to break up the uh, gopher mounds. And, and then we'll come across it with a field cover cultivator the same way, just so the shovels, just, if it's on a flat surface, it ain't doing nothing. Just to try and break them up and not level it off. And, and over the wet years, we've had a quarter that we farmed or took on, and uh, they got stuck two or three times out there. They just need to know where the boundaries were the, and the low spots. But come to planting time, he planted into corn, and we didn't quite have a big enough tractor on the planter, <coughs> full air cart time to plant it too. So he got stuck many different times out there and one spot was in a low flat it was not really wetland but it was low we were waiting for the tractor to come there and pull it out and as you stood there in the ground if you walked your feet the water would actually come up in your footprints uh, we hooked down with the four-wheel drive and basically the tractor just fell through the sod roof mass I guess uh, we made two or three rounds with him and pulled the four-wheel drive ahead of it we seeded it all that fall, if we had never told you anything about it, we had never known that we could not actually pull the planter in there with the corn assist tractor. So <coughs> another thing that we did learn, soil structure was, is, is important too. If you were to go out there and plow that or chisel plow it, there's, you went to got seeded, what we got seeded, I know that. So we tore up all that root mass and you had to drive on. This is just a picture of corn on the CRP <coughs> with the, still got the remaining residue there. We always go with corn. I think we've tried soybeans a little bit. Uh, big thing with corn is you have bigger or you have broader control of weeds. Uh, you can get the broad leaves, you can get the grass with round up ready corn. Means uh, usually CRP and hard country <coughs> always has chemical discipline in it. Uh, you're limited on your chemicals on the beans. Uh, the other part is beans, they get about ankle high on expired CRP. Yield is nothing to break about at all. And they're only ankle high. Usually the beans are laying on the ground, you get half the crop to come back. So we always go with corn first year out of CRP, possibly beans the second year. If we have an excess moisture issue on it. And with the corn too, if we never done it again, we kind of just did a little bit. But we have an option if, if the corn doesn't make it, we can chop it so it's not a total loss. And this is corn on CRP. Our yields, we've always been happy with them. I mean, they're never your big top yields, but in our country, we can get 120 on CRP provided to get adequate rain during the summer. And where your normal good ground would probably be that 150, 160, so it's really after the way it comes out. Um, we started adding cover crops uh, to improve the operation on the spring and winter wheat field. We noticed come springtime, we're getting more saturated, we had trouble getting into the we added the cover crops in 2008. We improved that spring seeding. Once you take the weed off, everything's dormant. You've you know, got nothing growing there, enough the excess moisture. We try to put a winter weed or a rye in, so in the spring it will come back growing. And the seed either well, depends on the either corn or beans probably. We kill off the <coughs> 
started getting a little more diversified in the <laughs> mixture. I always added radish, I guess that was probably the first thing we started off with. Since then, we've added multiple. Some other reasons, like you said, the trackability, uh, especially on the wheat ground, to go into corn the next year. Uh, you fought the corn planter because it was wheat underneath the wheat stubble. Harbor crops were there that improved the infiltration to get the water in the ground. Um, use up that extra excess surface moisture. Uh, we want uh, to increase our organic matter, trying to see if we can use these cover crops to cut back on fertilizer. And up in our country, drain, drain tile, we're not in favor of it. We live on the river. We get everybody's drain when they put the tile in. You know, we always see the end result. Seems like most of our ground is always on the bottom end of somebody's drain, so it's not a big <coughs> Spring uh, corn planting, um, this is a cover, this is wheat or winter wheat, wheat I think, wheat, um, with probably rye. <coughs> Coming in with corn, and uh, that spring was. It was fairly wet. Um, it was the one we let go over. I think so. One of these we let go one spring, planted it, and let it go after a week or so after it was planted. And it was a cold spring, and we figured the corn would never amount to nothing to start with. Um, we kept watching that the corn was actually dark green and appeared to, and it, it was actually it seemed like it was ahead of everything else that was more bare ground. We had no reader, had no idea why. Um, I know for the cover crops, we were told that you need to the harvest more sunlight earlier in the spring. And it, it's uh, it like it gets the ground rolling in the spring earlier, especially for the crops that uh, like a more ground more, especially. And then with the cover crop, especially on the corn planter, if it was a little bit wet, the green plants was like washing the planter, and you didn't fight the blood as bad as we did. By the cover crops, We're trying to said, fill our organic matter, try to reduce the fertilizer cost, and then the, the weed pressure is, is way down. You got something out there growing, feeding against the weeds. So you, you plant the weed that you want to control. That's kind of another thing in our book. For the soil biology and uh, added diversity, and then yeah, pushing the leg green cover crops. <coughs> nitrogen and enhance mixture nitrogen for nutrient cycling. Then you add crops in the cover crop that you normally cannot put in your normal rotation to diversify it, get it broke up, get rid of the routine. You know, we've tried different ways to get cover crops out in the well, corn especially, soybeans too. So we're bored and we added this cover crop attachment to our sprayer, just an old, old, old behind spinner box that we uh, mounted a Honda on it. <coughs> just a broadcasting, I think we just used turnip and radish and clover or something in there, and just broadcast out some corn to try it, see what we could come up with here. And it worked, just biggest thing is time the rainfall after you broadcast, and after that, <coughs> This was a radish turnip winter wheat. Actually, this year was not spread with that little one. We rented a roll gator with a spinner box on a fertilizer box and did it a year or so after the can prototype one. And it, we got enough rain there and caught it. Really this was close to home. Dad was going to this corn for silage, anyways. Uh, we chopped the corn off of it. Some of the turnips and radishes were actually knee high in there. Chopper, but we're not looking for corn yield, and we're looking for tonnage. Some of this we run cattle on, fence it, put our uh, heifers out there in the fall, over the trees on it, and that will lay it all off. Some other ways of um, broadcasting cover crops, we've used a plane before, it looks cool. Uh, basically, <laughs> no results whatsoever on the plane. I don't know if we don't put enough on or if we 
gets to go green, but it's, it's a waste of money in our part. We've done it uh, two different times, not three different times. Yeah. There it is. Drilling versus brine. You can drill it, it's 10 times better, but in the standing crops, you know, the drilling is hard to do, but uh, in the corn. Mm -hmm. The drilling is a sure thing almost. And the broadcasting, I don't know if you've got a 50%. Um, so we took some junk out of the trees and <laughs> made this inner cedar and, and uh, just got some old John Deere planter unit for openers. That's all I used them for is the openers. I tried using them plate part to put bigger seeds through them, but they're old and decrepit. But uh, put that Belmar on it and took the tube and put it right behind the opener and run the small seed through that Belmar. Pretty much same deal, radish and turnip and uh, clover. It's <coughs> about a sure thing. So. Yeah, you get the seed in the ground any moisture at all, it, it'll germinate, it'll grow. The big seed, beans, peas, stuff like that we ever use there, we finally gave up on it. Besides, the units didn't work very good. Or there was, you said they were wore out. The, you can see a plant here and there, but it wasn't, couldn't get a good enough rate or a plant stand to justify doing that anymore. So in the last two years now, we're just on small seeds. another picture and that's one of the results in the, between the corn rows. This is uh, after pea harvest. We've been done a few fields, not too many, but uh, trying to do bio strip till. <coughs> Said we pull air cart behind the planter, put our fertilizer down, and we mixed up peas and winter wheat. Run that through the air cart, which is the fertilizer over on the side of the. I think it's the taller stuff. Yeah. Piece. And then to run radish seed through the corn planter, and then uh, by using beet plates, you can run radish seed through the planter and let that go. Come in there the following year and plant corn right next to, close to, onto. We don't use. GPS much on the planner. He runs that, so he's kind of computer illiterate. But. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see too the, the cattails actually. And this was drying up that fall. So here's that. Well, we see them through, I think on that corner, all of the cattails. Some of them were stalls as a tractor cap. We just seed it through them with the, with the this cover crop thing. But uh, well, the next year it did drop out some again, so we weren't able to get that. But with the cattails there and that, you, you can carry up, it can be met or wet in there. And nine times out of ten, you can't get through. But if there is a bare wet spot in there, stay out of it because in the back of the tractor at the beginning, here's right in the cattails where right? some of it turned out pretty good. This is the planter we use for it with the fertilizer cart. This is the next spring. Uh, we use winter wheat for rye, I think winter wheat, and uh, the strips are still there. Then we were trying to shoot right on top of the rows, and then after we thought about it, these 15 inches the most you're going to be off. What does the difference does it really make? The corn roots will get to where they need to go for the nutrients, so we did try to stay as close as we could to the rows, but it was not issue where we weren't concerned about it. This is another thing we tried with wetlands that have dried up and off. We spread winter wheat in everything. Uh, I think we mowed them later on that fall. Open winter wheat would grow where it was dry enough to grow in the spring to try and get back some of these wet wet spots. Same deal with broadcast. Uh, it was a big waste of time. <coughs> Another trouble we've had over the years with the cover crops is getting them planted as soon as we can. And the last few years, you get going on harvest, we're a little short of help. You ain't got time to get them to drill right away, so you get done combining, and then you're sick of this and that. And you know, let's go see cover crop. Well, I don't know. It's a week later, is it too late? Well, this year, finally, we got the drill 
in the same field and had enough help that that's the that's the best way to do it. Um, I know different ones have tried to tie the drill behind the combine, but that doesn't really work. But and all our hired help is the kids. Yeah. So summer is good when school starts. We're this back is, to a three man band. This is pea harvest. So yeah, summertime we got a lot of help. Our combine crew is pretty young. <laughs> <laughs> This is the beginning stages of trying to get the, the livestock more into the into the cover crop. Uh, this year is a like an eight acre patch. We right at home. We uh, our silage piles off kind of that track, and we pile all our hay out here. Well, before we no till, we put all our hay out here, and come springtime, we had ruts up to your knees, and and then you'd spend half the summer beating them down and try to get something seeded in there and it was always half a crop. Since we've been no-tilling it, uh, we put the hay out there come springtime. We don't have hardly have any ruts out there. We get the hay off, knock it down a little bit with a drag or even a box scraper which really good at bringing much trash on the ground. Just shape the tops off, pull in there and seed it. And uh, this happened to be it was a mixture we used for feed. Seated on the 20th of June, and uh, this was might have been September, and then this grew back again. This is the regrowth. You can see the bales are really on top of things that didn't get them off the first crop. But, um, it was amazing how much regrowth comes a little later in the fall. So like their big theory is on the cover crops, all late is too late to plant them. Uh, it's never too late. I know we've seeded some cover crops after silage time, which is about. 10th of September for us. Uh, he did some winter wheat actually to talk to the <coughs> This side of the trees over here is where the, the winter or heifers out on. Uh, we actually got, I don't know, six, seven inches of winter wheat growth that fall. It was after the 10th of September. So, it, you know, every year is different. <laughs> This was a, that same, I don't know, this is a different field. We interceded with that fancy hook that we got there, and this was after corn harvest or during corn harvest, radish and turnips there. After a hard frost, and they're still green, still growing. Well, 20th of November, I think this was. Cedar and maybe chop that so now you got something growing after you chop it instead of just black ground and uh, one on the right there. That's a full season cover crop we did this year of about 13 mixture. We seeded it 3rd of July and just let it go. Now when we were able to turn the cows out onto it, graze a lot of it off. But that's the other thing is we don't like to graze it down right down to the black ground again. I believe 30, 40 percent. You know, another thing on this field, uh, we got, I think, two pieces, one across the road from one another. The ground should be the same. This piece, uh, you got crops the same as always before. Uh, we have no reason. We've had uh, soil scientists from North Dakota, he's even come out and looked at it, done a few soil tests. It doesn't seem to be that bad on that of it, but it's just, it's just not as good as we would like it to do. So with the full season crop, we did this, <coughs> hoping to make the ground better, put some fertilizer back on the ground, give it a break. Basically, it's a new way of summer hollow in our book. And then being very able to put the cows on there, we speeded up the breakdown of it, put the manure on there, and we did nothing. We seeded it. Like we sprayed it. Right we sprayed it right after we seeded it. That's all we've done with it. <coughs> picture of the cows grazing on some close to home there. This one, I think oats we put in for feed, we cut it and hate it, we just baled it and we pulled in there to see that cover crop. <coughs> Three, four way mix there. And just turn the cows out there in the fall. And the good and the bad of it, it's always lush green. Cows will love it. They'll 
today there's people on the tug and chase them out of there. Um, I'd say a, a good suggestion is if you have that option, you would want to manage them because they will eat it down to like this carpet, you let them, and they'll eat the old dead grass stand. So you have to chase them off and lock them off after you get to the point where you don't want them there. <coughs> Lessons learned that getting the cover crop seed in a timely manner. That's, that's the picture of the drill behind the combine. That's, that's a, one of the keys in our book. Uh, drilling versus broadcasting, same deal. You can get the seed in the ground, and it's, it's a must, I think. We have had a couple instances where last fall, uh, we did spread some with the tear gator after pea harvest because we got three, four, five, six inches of rain that we, and if we've been out through the drill, we've been driving through water, running it up. We took a chance on it, spread it with the tear gator. It was really a potty, potty <coughs> field. And it too. He was able to, I mean, by broadcasting, you can throw it out in the water, right along the water, and, and you can get everything where the drill, you'd be playing in the mud and, and packing, and be more compaction. It turned out actually that one didn't turn out pretty good. Well. The other part on my side of the combines, Dad's always told us, no, you know, you've got to save every kernel you can because you get one shot at the combine. Well, since we've been into cover crops, if something goes out the back of the combine, that always seems to grow. The difference is what it does. So we're not as fussy on set the combines, nothing else, kick them in the butt a little bit, get a few more acres done, see a little more cover crops. <coughs> <laughs> um, don't wait for the moisture to plant cover crop. We've always done that. July, August, it forgets to rain. <coughs> Use a 12-inch crescent wrench out the cracks. Why do you want to plant anything? All you're going to do is wear the drill out. Two weeks later, it rains, and you go, why didn't we do that? If it had been done, it would have been an awesome crop. Um, when we first started, the local support from anybody, but we were doing it in the area for the most part. They all laugh at you and whatever else, but it's they're starting to watch, see what's going on, wondering why, peeking around the corner, driving around. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, from when we started doing this, you never stop learning. It's keep an open mind. There's so many things that there is to be learned. Uh, I think we've only touched the bottom of the iceberg for the most part it's given the I'm going to say that it's uh, cover crops I think are the big thing coming thing. Um, in our book they're awesome. What can you do more? Uh, just try some different things. Don't be afraid of a failure because every every failure you learn something. Uh, 2013 you did straw management. You know, we run the stripper heads and and uh, a lot of guys don't raise wheat anymore and we had quite a bit of it that year and a lot of guys are wanting straw. So let's put the straight heads back on and drop our straw and bale up and get rich. Well it sounded like a good idea at the time. You bale that, you still get a strip of even with this trap spreaders, a strip of of a thicker residue that the baler don't pick up. And we got one Rotor combine, when well, you drop the straw with them, the chaff gets dropped in the same spot. Awesome. Yeah. So we uh, ended up dragging our weed stubble just to try to even out the residue again. And that's one other thing we back up a ways that we moved before we went to a stripper head. We bought one of them big heavy harrows to residue or to uh, manage our manage residue. And uh, first time or two we were out in Bismarck, we uh, talked to Dwayne Beck and we went uh, left with her tail between her legs. And he was, Why do you need one of them? Um, we also got one. <laughs> so we sold it. And uh, yeah, just by putting a chaff spreader on and then the uh, stripper head was a big jump for the small grains as far as risk and management. And, and by using the drag in 2013, we just used our little yeah. normal drag. It's a waste of time too, it helps, but it, 
Thanks, Dwayne. You helped us on that one wherever you're at here. I think you left. And you sick of us. <laughs> this is another thing on, uh, we noticed we have the yield monitors. You guys can believe them if you want to believe them. I mean, they give you an idea, but you can make them read whatever you want. Um, <laughs> this, is, uh, this is actually calibrated, but um, <laughs> okay. This is the CRP after five years of crop. Um, before we had the mapping, we just had the brown box in there, and just by watching them over the years of the our no till, I kept looking at them. I kept saying to him, I said, I almost think our yields are getting more even over the hills and the low spots. Well, after we got the mapping, this field here has a, it's kind of not real potty, but it's it's got a soil types are very similar in this one. So you can see. And there's a draw that runs on the north side of that quarter there, but uh, there's a bulk corn in the smaller field there with the first year of a CRP it was corn. And just this is what I'm seeing, and, and I, after seeing it, <coughs> watching it, our fields are evening out more after more we no till them. I think, as you can see from that CRP, but, um, yeah, like I say, he said it was an observation. We had the brown boxes, we noticed it. And we do have land that is gravel. There's a gravel pit in the corner of the field. And there's wood ground on a certain field where you, know, you can get your 30, 40 bushel beans. And over the top, the old way was, it was five, maybe 10. And beans are, I guess, the most noticeable on that particular field. They burn up midsummer. Last year, two years ago, we walked out there in the July, first part of August. They were still green. You could see where the gravel veins were starting to show up. They were still holding their composure. So then we, we mapped this corn that fall and kind of noticed it on that. Just as an observation for you guys to see too. Some of the future challenges is the crop rotation. When we got rid of that a long time ago. Uh, everybody asked us, what's our rotation? We don't have one. Make it work for you. However, don't be afraid to put something in where traditionally never was before or was before. We uh, kind of read our ground to what it needs, put the crop in there that's going to benefit you the most at the time. Moisture was probably the easiest one to, to say if we got some ground that's getting too wet or it seems to be getting wetter and wetter, throw the corn in there. Um, it looks like it's drying out, maybe the wheat and mix it up. If you got weed problems, push a crop in there, you can control the weeds better. Yeah, we don't for the most part, we don't put like corn on corn. Um, we try it only a time or two. We had really good luck with that, but I mean that's. Um, but other than that, we try to try to break it up some. And we don't put our same shoe on the same foot every day. Yes, but. And the cover crop benefits what we're seeing there. They're outrageous. Uh, it's we're we're hooked on them. We're hooked on them. We're trying to do more and more with them every year, we're trying to get them in earlier, trying to interseed some stuff. We have the interseed <coughs> some, some soybeans a couple different times. If everything is right, you can broadcast that right before the leaves fall, get a catch of winter wheat. It'll be growing with the combine beans. Um, and it'll be there in the spring, too. Um, same deal as broadcasting. It's not a sure thing. How much do you want to spend to, to take a chance? So, we're not afraid to take a chance most times. We control when we first started, I think the grasses were a big thing, big, big problem. Um, since we got better weed control, our weeds changed in the beginning from grasses to broad leaf. Right now, grasses are almost a thing of the past for us. Um, they're there a little bit, but it's, it's getting, it seems to be less and less all the time. Um, you get the cover crops in there. They shade things out, plant the weed of your choice. Um, you plant something that you know you can control, that's a huge benefit. And then we'd like to get better integrated with the cattle and, and the crops, you know, make them work together more and more. Cattle are more 
dads, but um, we all work together. If we got land that we can run them on, it's simple. We don't have to fence up as quick and easy. If we can put a cover crop on there and run the cows or calves on it, we try to work. Thank you. Thank Thank you. Any questions? I enjoyed your video on your crossing the water holes in the spring. How do you handle your sidewall attached in the spring of the corn? We don't seem to have an issue. The no till in the first few years, compaction was a problem. Our, all of our stamps with the drills of water, yeah, sidewall compaction was a big issue first few years. <coughs> you get into it five, six years. Crusting is a big thing when you get your when you're conventional. You get a hard rain crusting, you don't even know if that is anymore. It's, it's gone because you got the organic matter in the ground and it's not an issue. Any other questions? Yep. How do you put your fertilizer in the corn? Run it all through the cart. Side by side, five inches over a boat. Um, we do have some soil tests. Um, we don't get the biggest yields. We have got uh, how much of your neighbors can you believe for yields? You know what are they telling you is what you're doing. Um, I'd say last year we were probably doing as good if not better. We shoot for about 300 pounds of product through the planter. We can go 350, 400. I think 350 is the most we've ever done. We run it all down the planter. That's all we do in the corn. How about you? Residual herbicide in your corn will be used. Do you use any? What's that? Do you have any residual herbicide use on your corn or do you just do Roundup or what's your program? The question was, was there any residual herbicide use on your corn or just use Roundup? We use some pre plants. We used to use mostly Roundup. If you're going to do the inner seeding in there, you have to watch your chemicals for that. Um, we're not big on trees. We're trying to get some of that more into it, a little bit more, because there's a few of them we have used. Uh, we have put our tree plants down, <coughs> probably not sprayed the rest of the summer. And then last year, we two years ago, we got some corn. We put the rod, didn't use a tree plant. Uh, I don't think we sprayed any of the that particular field with it. And last year we had 70 acres of flowers and put a pre on that and never sprayed nothing. There wasn't a week one in that. Um, we're trying to get back away from some of the chemicals too, but if you got weed problems, you gotta you gotta get rid of the weeds or they will fight you and the butt. Well, uh, cover crop in uh, weed stubble. Seems like if we leave the straw, it's hard to get the, the cover crop started because of all that trash. It just won't grow through that straw. Have you run into that problem? It seems like it's a little slower. I mean, it always grows, but it's, I don't know if it's like, you can get the tallest crop we got all from compared to our pea ground. Some of the other things to keep in mind, it isn't always what's above the ground. What you're putting into the ground too is a huge benefit. So if you get root structure in the ground, you got something along the ground, you know you got roots in the ground, so you're still it's still a big benefit. Do you guys think what's um fertilizer down when you put the cover crops in? No. Yeah, no, we don't. When we broadcast some of that we use to put some urea in for a carrier on some of that. But the stuff we run through the drill, we've never put in any fertilizer down. The stuff we put in that uh, interseeded with uh, burns and clover. I think the stuff in that full season with the red clover. The clover we ain't had real good luck with them. Some of it grows, a lot of it don't. Now, this last year we had, oh, it was 
last year. Two years ago was the last we had a test that we missed last fall. We got some of the three and a half, and I think we got some fours that are not. <coughs> it seems like the last couple of years it's, it's come a lot more than the first six or seven years. Okay, Andy and Mitch will be around for a while, so we'll catch them at break if you have any more questions, and let's give them a big round of applause. Thank you.